Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out on such short notice. Um, and thank you to Lindsay for being so gracious to share some of her very precious family visit time um, with us tonight. And welcome to all those on Zoom who have come from far and wide to join us this evening. Um, it is a delight uh, to spend this time with Lindsay and to hear the work, to hear of the work that she does um, so well with such deep love and passion. She works for uh, CUNO, which is the Quaker United Nations office out of Geneva. She lives in Bonn with her family. Around issues of climate change and uh, environmental degradation as a um, justice, a peace and justice issue, and, and a human rights issue, and with such dear, um, passionate um, commitment. And it is so needed um, in this world to have people like Lindsay and those with whom she works, and we are blessed, blessed to have her with us tonight. So welcome. Does that sound loud? <laughs> Does that sound loud enough for you? Good. Yeah? Um, I just want to say thank you, and thank you, Jill and Jim, and thank you all for inviting me. My spiritual life began in this church, and sermons by Reverend Dick Jones and now by Jill Graham, and both of them spoke about Jesus' teachings of love and not fear. And that had a profound influence also now in what I do. But I remember the choir. I remember the robes. I remember Mr. Pearson intensely at the organ. I remember amazing adult volunteers for the youth group that helped us with a healthy space to grow. And I worship here. I worship with Quakers. And my soul is ecumenical. And I work at the international level. And our climate work is enriched by speaking together with interfaith, with indigenous peoples and with wider civil society communities. So tonight I'm going to speak for about 25 minutes so that we have time for questions. I'm going to talk briefly about the Quaker United Nations office in Geneva and New York, what we do, the highlights of what the climate scientists are telling us, the COP, what is the conference of parties every year, the climate negotiations come together in different cities and they make decisions on what states will do together and what are the political challenges we're seeing now. I want to talk briefly on the role of the USA in these politics and how we can help. First slide, Jim. We have um, four slides, not too much, but I wanted to show you some pictures. So on this slide, you're going to see a picture of the Quaker United Nations office in Geneva. It's a lovely old house. We have four programs, and the programs are human rights and refugees. They are climate change, or what we call the human impacts of climate change, peace and disarmament, and sustainable and just economic systems. And we all connect together because all those issues come together. So there's our house. There are the four programs, and the other program I wanted to highlight is we do a summer school for young people every, for two weeks every July, and they get to meet the UN, they get to meet diplomats, um, civil society, everything, and it's, they come from all around the world. Last year we had students from five different continents. Next slide, Jim. Next slide. So briefly, um, for my work, I work at three what we call international processes. The first one, I work at the Human Rights Council. If you see a picture to the bottom right of a young woman speaking into a microphone with a red light, her name is Anna. She spoke at the Human Rights Council yesterday and made a statement before 150 states about human rights and climate change and the responsibility of private sector businesses. Um, that's what we do. And that statement we made was co-sponsored by the World Council of Churches, the Anglican Communion, and Soka Gakkai Buddhist International Interfaith. Um, when we're at the Human Rights Council, we call for urgent, transformative action to protect human rights and avoid greater suffering. 
we helped fight for something which was identified as a new human right to a clean, sustainable, and healthy environment. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 75 years old, we now have a human right to a healthy environment, use it. The US tried to block it, it was passed, they stepped back, we need to call. It's a positive thing, yeah? The other thing is supporting human rights defenders who are increasingly being arrested, imprisoned, or murdered, and statements like yesterday. We also work at the, no, back to the slide, the climate change, it's something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They collate all the climate science from around the world, hundreds and hundreds of scientists over seven years, working voluntarily, most of them, thousands of papers, Jim, if we can have that slide again. And, they, and what they do is they take that and they put their thousands of pages into 40 pages of a summary. All the governments have to approve that 40-page summary. When they do, that summary has legal status. And we are there to fight for protecting the science, for ensuring that the states don't try to weaken the language, um, to push for um, highlighting the, the calls for urgent action and for available action. Quakers are the only faith-based organization as an observer. The Holy See is also an observer, but they keep talking about their status so they don't actually get there. Um, we can speak after states and we can help influence language. We also take what they do. So the picture, next slide, Jim. The picture with the big screens, whoops, not that one, go back. Mm -hmm. No, go back, the other one. There you go. The picture with the big thing on the screen is me speaking with all the states there, and that's the climate science. We then took their climate science, and we highlighted their urgent actions, and we put them in a booklet, and we translated into Arabic, Spanish, and soon into French. And we handed this out in all the negotiations because the IPCC, this big science group, had not yet translated their science and were in Dubai. We were the only, so we, this is the kind of thing we do, but we focus down on what they do. And then finally, we work at the International Climate Change Negotiations. There's a picture on the far left of me handing our Arabic publications to, that was um, the, the mission for Palestine. Up above, you have the interfaith, huge civil society. That was in Glasgow. So when we're working on the negotiations, for 10 years, we brought countries together, very diverse groups of countries around the table to speak off the record on sensitive issues. We also do the publications like this to try to push for ethical um, action. And we do side events, press conferences, and then we do this beautiful interfaith dialogue just before the cops start. Slide three, my dear, you're on call. <laughs> so briefly on the climate science. Um, there's an organization called the Stockholm Resilience Institute. When I went back to graduate work, this was the first thing I had to look at. They brought scientists from many different disciplines, and they d identified nine planetary boundaries. And then they looked at where the boundaries being pushed over from what the Earth should be able to cope with. In 2009, the main boundary was species extinction. As most of you know, the rates of species extinction are off the record of anything that we've experienced in our human time. But the others was chemical pollution, right? Phosphorus and um, nitrogen, and then climate change is building. By 2015, we were pushing boundaries on land use, deforestation, etc., cetera, um, soil erosion, industrial agriculture, the effects on land. Um, climate change is increasing. The chemical pollution is increasing. And by 2023, you see now we've got um, six crossed of the nine boundaries. And that includes something called novel entities. And novel entities include things that are, we're, we're pushing out as human beings, but we still don't have enough research to know their effect. Nanochemicals or um, GMO, um, any of these kind of creation that we're doing, but we haven't actually really fully understood the final effect on our Earth. So that's called novel. But you can see how these are being pushed. Climate change increasing as temperatures are increasing. And that's, that's scary, but one of the things that I love about that picture is that the drivers or the root causes of water driving climate change are often the same things driving soil um, erosion and land use change and freshwater scarcity and chemical pollution. 
those, those root causes are often all linked. So when you start transforming them, you're not just helping climate change, you're also helping biodiversity, healthier soils, fresh water. Um, last slide, or slide four. Um, thank you, Jill. You've, been, you've taken over. <laughs> yeah, next slide. You have to push one more. And then I'm going to stop, because I've, I've only got four slides. But um... Whoops, oh, keep going. There's one in between, back, I guess. That's it. I want to talk about root causes because our dear friend from the press today asked me, what do we need to know? What are, we, what are we avoiding? And I said, we're not talking about the root causes. We're often talking about the symptoms, but we're not talking about what's driving. So I'll tell you what the, the climate scientists are saying are the root causes of climate change. To quote, unsustainable energy use, unsustainable land use and land use change, and unsustainable lifestyle patterns of consumption and production. In energy, we're looking at fossil fuel extraction and burning is the highest. In economics, we're looking at our economic systems that are based on unlimited material growth on a planet with natu limited natural resources, a no-brainer, right? In land, we're looking at industrial agriculture primarily, increased um, use of eating meat and unhealthy diets, and of course, that all links to deforestation use of pesticides, monoculture, soil depletion, species extinction. You all know it here. You see it happening. Um, interesting science statistic, 2 billion people are either overweight or obese in the world. 2 billion. 821 million are undernourished. We have flipped. <laughs> um, so when they talk about diets, they talk about unhealthy diets, processed food, food and, and the effect of that kind of agriculture and, and use on our bodies, but also on our land. Another quote I wanted to share. Globally, households with incomes in the top 10% contribute to about 35 to 45% of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why climate change is called not only a spiritual crisis, but also a wealth crisis. The wealthier are driving this, not the poorest. The current emissions right now, if you were to continue doing what we're doing around the world, we'd be up to probably at least a 3.2 Celsius increase by 2100. We've already increased about 1.1, 1.2, depending on which year, and El Nino, et cetera. A three Celsius rise, a scientist described as unmanageable and unimaginable. We talk about a 1.5 limit, that's what we have been pushing for with the Paris Agreement. We'll probably pass that, but that doesn't mean we have to pass it by a lot. It depends on what we do now and how urgently we do. The planned actions are saying we could go down. If we say we're going to do everything we're going to do, maybe it'll be about 2.8, blah, 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 blah. But you need finance for that. You need political will. And the other thing I wanted to say, and this is a good news, seven years ago they said temperatures would be 4.8 Celsius by 2100. Now they're looking at 3.2. So there is this, there is, they are seeing some emissions are going up, but they're also seeing plans being implemented to try to bring it down. To give you a sense of what that means is in the last mini ice age, a thousand years, it would warm maybe 0.5 Celsius to one Celsius in a thousand years. We've just done it in a hundred years. So we're also talking about how fast it's happening how do we adapt when it's happening that fast? That's part of the crisis. Now, I want to tell you, um, you, can, you can take down the screen now. You can take down that. In, in the climate science negotiations in March last year, they were finalizing this huge report of thousands and thousands of pages, seven years of reports, and they had this amazing sentence, and I'm going to quote this to you. The scientists said, high confidence, urgent, feasible, and equitable near-term options are already available at scale to address climate change and improve human well-being and planetary health. I'll read that again. Urgent, feasible, and equitable near-term options are already available at scale to address climate change and improve human well-being and planetary health. That sentence was cut. It wasn't cut by the scientists, it was cut by the politicians. 
The words they didn't like were urgent, equitable, available at scale. We fought and fought and fought to get that sentence back. Some states were really supporting us. Politically, it wasn't comfortable, and we got a sentence about feasible and um, near-term and available. Okay? That's what happens, and that's what I want to talk about for the COP. These are the challenges we're facing. In the climate spaces, nobody's denying it's happening. You don't have climate deniers particularly anymore. The science is too strong. What you do have is arguments over how we deal with it. And the US is a classic example of this. You have to look at the money and power to understand why decisions are being made. The wealthy extraction countries, US, Canada, UK, Norway, Australia, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, where the COP was, etc. They fight fossil fuel language on every corner. They don't want it mentioned. They promote something called carbon capture storage, which is we pump the emissions down in the ground, or they will push for something called carbon dioxide removal. We'll just plant lots of trees, but we'll keep doing what we're doing. Um, the USA is now also pushing for something called solar radiation modification. Um, it's what we call the Russian roulette. I can talk about it later if you want. It's one of these geoengineering, unproven, potentially even more dangerous to use. OPEC during the COP sent a letter was leaked by OPEC threatening every OPEC member if they did anything on loosening language on fossil fuels. That was the COP we were in in Dubai. I was incredibly depressed to go to this COP. Um, the science, the IPCC, off, they didn't even have their own office. They had to share a pavilion. They were at the far end of the COP. It took about 15 minutes to get there. And when you got into this building, you first had to go past OPEC and the Gas Exporting Consortium before you got to the climate scientists. It was just bizarre. And so this is what we're up against sometimes. I also want to quickly talk about net zero. Net zero is something we hear a lot. Net zero is... Um, what we talk about a balance between what we create and what we can absorb in terms of emissions. Um, net zero was not a phrase in the Paris Agreement in 2015. It became politically acceptable afterward. It's scientifically okay, but it's incredibly deceptive. So when you hear people talk about net zero, be careful. Because for net zero to be even possible, you have to rapidly reduce fossil fuels. Rapidly reduce fossil fuels. But Nobody wants to talk about that. They just talk about net zero. And that's a danger because we lose time. So they're promoting things like when I talk about carbon capture storage or carbon dioxide removal, carbon capture storage is ineffective, expensive, inequitable, and it's not even proven to scale. If you talk to anyone who works on it, they've been trying this for years. But countries like the US and Canada, Norway, are pushing it as the answer we carry on doing what we're doing, fossil fuels, we'll pump it in the ground. Can you imagine telling your children that you spent all this money on technology that wasn't actually meant to be used except for hard to abate emissions? That's the language, hard to abate emissions. And then we've got all this carbon, you've got greenhouse gases in some cave somewhere that could have leakage and we haven't actually transformed our energy systems because we put all this money into trying to maintain fossil fuels. These are the fights we're seeing. Also for carbon dioxide removal, this idea of planting masses of trees, afforestation, but not actually reducing the root causes. That's why I said to our colleague here, we need to be honest about why this is happening. Um, and I th also want to say something that is not talked about enough but needs to be. Land is currently a sink, right? It absorbs CO2. The warmer the temperatures come, the higher we see incidence of wildfires, infestation of certain insects, collapse of, of species in, in Germany, whole forests are collapsing for beetles coming in that weren't there before. Um, land can become a source. So now we're looking at it as sink, you plant all these trees, as temperatures warm, etc., cetera, fire fires, etc., it becomes a source. And that becomes terrifying. Also, the permafrost in the Arctic, the Arctic is warming faster. And then you have the melting of the permafrost and what's being released. That's why we have to keep temperatures. We have to act now. So good things about the COP28. The science was unavoidable. We got finally the language on fossil fuels we needed. It was called trans, 
transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy systems and global stock takes. We got the transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy systems on paper, finally, global stock take. Um, we had stronger, than, stronger language than we expected. We did have loopholes, but we actually had a better outcome than I had even thought we could. I can talk about later why that happened. I think it was pressure between the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, we also had something called every country like the USA has to do a nationally determined contribution. This is what we're going to do for the USA. It has to be grounded in a 1.5 now. And Biden, I understand, has put a hold on some of the new gas plants developments. You can correct me on this because I don't do national work. But um, I'm basically saying if you're going to do a new plant, you have to prove um, the climate side, that it's not harming. So there's increasingly using the science to be able to justify the action that is politically difficult. We also had a loss and damage fund um, activated. That's for the people, no matter what we do now, they are the most affected. And the loss and damage fund took us 10 years to get. In the COP, the United Arab Emirates gave 100 million, Germany gave 100 million, the US gave 13 million. So I'm gonna talk about what matters. Personal witness matters. It matters because you can inspire and you speak truth to power. Once with that political, that personal witness, you go to political witness and you speak from personal witness. So you're active politically and it makes a difference. It's exhausting, it looks like nothing's gonna happen, but things are changing. There are court cases all around the world. The UK just managed to get, the government just pulled out of an energy charter. It isn't happening fast enough. You won't think you're hitting your head against the wall but things are changing, and it's ever harder to deny why it's happening, and it's ever harder for companies to justify, because people are so much more aware. So don't give up. Ask if you're politically engaged. Here's a list of things you could ask. Ask your politicians to describe the actions that they're taking to build climate resilient, sustainable, and just communities in your region. Ask your politicians, what is our nationally determined contribution in the US? And is it in line with a 1.5 temperature limit? And if not, why? That's our risk, that's our safety if you allow these temperatures to go up. Ask them if their national adaptation plans promote sustainable community resilience in energy, economy, and agriculture. We talk about money and power. A lot of these changes are being pushed back because they change money and power. If you've got fossil fuel, a company, extractor who's able to control the fossil fuel use and sell, imagine if everybody had solar panels on their roof here. Not just the middle class and wealthier, but the poorest as well. In some countries, they're finding ways to subsidize so that people who can't afford it will still have solar panels on their roof. They start owning their own energy source. There's a whole shift of power going on here, right? And that's part of why it's being pushed, pushed back. Um, so you're talking about a more decentralized or more individually owned energy systems, more independent, and when you have your solar, anybody who's got solar, you're probably more aware of your use, right? You're looking at how much you've earned today, you're making sure you do your energy use when the sun's out. It, it's, it's beautiful, that transformation. The other thing is ask them, are we reducing our fossil fuel extraction and burning, or are we just taking out expensive geoengineering that could actually delay things and not work at the level we need them? The USA has the highest number of planned extraction projects than any other country in the world, as far as we're understanding from what's being reported. Also ask your politicians, um, are we delivering our fair historical share of financial support and action? The US is probably the largest still emitter of, for a developed country and historically as well. So what are we doing about that responsibility? And ask about our taxation. Is it progressive or is it regressive? I can talk about that too if you have a question, but most of our taxation is what we call regressive. It's based on labor. It's not based on assets. The whole economy has changed. And are we actually taxing wealth and getting that revenue to help us in the change? So I wanted to say it can feel overwhelming, but just remember this was what the, the climate scientists were trying to say to us. Urgent, feasible, equitable, and near-term options are already available at scale to address climate change and improve human well-being and planetary health. Every fraction of a degree counts. Everything we do now, from a 1.5 to a 3 point something, is a massive difference. 
1.5 is manageable, not for all countries. Island states, no. Low-lying states, no. But if we can keep it, and we can keep it down to that level rather than going up, it's not yet a given that it's going to go up to 3.2, but if we carry on the way we are, it will. Then finally, what we can do in the USA. We're one of the most unsustainable lifestyles in the world. That's probably why it's pretty overwhelming. Where do we start? I can't even walk to the grocery store. It's five miles away, and everybody has a car, right? It's hard, but we also have to remember that we're actually one of the most unsustainable societies in the world. We are the most politically influential. If the US and China are talking, there is progress at the negotiations. If they're divided, everything freezes. I said we're one of the highest G greenhouse gas emission of developed countries. We have, as I said, the most extensive plans for fossil fuel extraction. We have basically systemically failed to deliver on our climate finance for years. The US, it's just become a joke. And we spend over 800 billion on military. And our sustainable economics, there are so many ideas coming out, but we need to engage, right? We need to engage circular economics, su sufficiency, donate economics. There are ideas out there, but the way we run our economics now are driving our destruction of our planet. And then sustainable energy I talked about, but also about the poorest. If we forget the poorest, we're lost. We've, this is a justice issue. And part of the transformations have to make sure that we sh ensure that the poorest are part of the solutions. And then finally, ask where we spend our money. And I'm going to bring that back to military spending. It's coming more and more into the negotiations as an issue. Military emissions are 5% of emissions, but nobody have, no country has to record their military emissions. That's becoming an issue more and more because then our, our IPCC modeling are all wrong because we're not actually including 5% of the military emissions. But it's the money. It's the question of, are we actually safe? the way we're spending our money, over 800 billion a year. Does that make us safe? Or should we be using that money to transform our agriculture, transform our energy, and transform our economics, and support the poorest in this country? Healthcare, public services, you name it. So our voice is spiritual, and our voice is ethical, and this church, love and, f and not fear, is what, when you go out there, Spread the love, not the fear. It's really easy to do the doom language, but it doesn't inspire people. It paralyzes them. So inspire with what you see as you want to do for your children, for the way you want to live and you want to change. Even if your one contribution isn't going to change everything, it's going to, it's going to inspire and make people think, okay, maybe I could try that or do a bit, yeah? And once you start doing some things, you feel less overwhelmed. And then the protection of nature. So finally, the IPCC has said, we have a brief moment, a brief window in time, acting now as urgently as we can so that we do not, to quote, miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. If folks have questions, I have the mic. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. My name's Trisha, and I, I was very curious about just the initial way that I understood what the talk was going to be was what what it was like for you at this particular last conference. I know you said a lot right now, but just the tone and the feeling and the spirit. Okay. Um, should I do one question at a time? Would that be easier? Yeah. And I, I'm sorry. Mm. If you could speak just a little bit slower, oh. that would help. Okay. Thank you. So it was my tenth. You know, I wonder if you clip your mic to the top of your sweater. It might. Um... How's that? It was my 10th conference of parties, my 10th COP. Um, I really wasn't looking forward to this. 
I mean, it's in Dubai, which is a country that is a city and a country that is, is made its wealth on fossil fuels. It was being run, the presidency, the person who's the president, was head of an oil fossil fuel company. Um, it was almost a joke, like why are we bothering to go, right? If that's what we've got here. But it actually turned out to be a stronger outcome than I had expected. And that's why I'm always sort of trying to remind myself to keep going and not despair. It was a surreal experience. Everything works in Dubai. Everything works, right? And I'd never been there. And, um, and everything in the conference worked. We were in Egypt the year before. There was no water. There was no food. The air conditioning didn't work. It was just, you know, and then in Dubai, everything was smooth. But what was so weird was there were no civil society protests outside. Same in Egypt. No protests, right? Everybody's on the other side of the conference area um, in a kind of, it was like, it used to be one of these world fairs. So you have all these things they go and they look at and the exhibitions and the ice cream. And so it, that was kind of bizarre. Glasgow was daily, nightly protests, you know, banging on, on doors and everything. Um, but Dubai was, it was just bizarre. It was just bizarre. And yet they got the global stock take, which had taken them, it was, it was, it, the Paris Agreement was created. And one of the things was a global stock take that every five years we have to decide where are we. And this was the first one. It wasn't five years, but it was the first one. And it was stronger than we thought. It was more hard line than we thought. This is what's happening. That helped because the science was there. The fossil fuel language, finally, 28 years later, and I think the reason they did was because the Saudis are really good at silencing everyone. The Saudis will just kill the room, right? Because they don't care about diplo diplomacy. And then the US stand behind them because it's easy, right? <laughs> let the Saudis do the dirty work, we'll just sit behind and Norway doesn't say anything and let the Saudis fight the thing. But the UAE wanted success. And I think that regional kind of discussions basically helped them to say, Saudis, step back a bit. We've got to do this. That doesn't mean that there weren't loopholes and there weren't, you know, I mean, everybody's extracting more than they were. US, Canada, UK, they're all increasing their extraction, possibly because they see the writing on the wall. But, you know, that in itself is like this surreal world that we live in. But I think the writing is, the writing is there. And, and I think people are seeing it. Insurance companies increasingly are refusing to insure new oil field expansions, right? Things are starting to shift. So the COP turned out to be better than thought and to actually make your, your contributions, every country has to say what they're gonna do for five years, to say it has to be grounded in a 1.5 temperature limit. That means you have to have the most urgent action. You have to prove that what you're saying you're going to do is going to keep temperatures lower. That was a big thing for the island states, and they felt better about that. And then there's more talk on finance, which is always African states. Where's the money that you promise? So it was better than I thought, but it was surreal. It was just surreal. And, this, and the, the, the kind of silencing of or attempt to physically put the science in a place where nobody knew where it was I found actually really sick <laughs> because in, in other cops, the IPCC scientists would have like something as you walk in, they'd have all their books out there. Something was happening. Yeah. Was there any, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my name is uh, Ken Terry, I'm from Sheffield. Uh, was there any discussion at the conference about the fact that <clears throat> India and China are still building large numbers of coal-fired power plants? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the Paris Agreement also, the Paris Agreement was agreed on something called um, common but differentiated responsibilities, right? So those countries that have benefited historically from industrialization have to lead on mitigation. And they're not. 
And as long as the US isn't doing its best at reducing its greenhouse gas emissions and reducing its extraction, India and China can just sit there and say, you're supposed to go first. So it, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. Um, and also, it, yeah, India is, they're also, they're, they're really an, interesting as a delegation. They're quite quiet in some ways. Um, they have severe poverty, right? And their coal-fired power plants are going to be, those are the killers. Coal is the worst, right? China's actually doing a lot more than it says, more than the U.S. But they're also the highest emitter. Per capita, they're not. Per capita, they are lower than most of the developed countries. But because their population is the largest and they have the highest emissions. Um, Canada walked out of the Kyoto Agreement because they started doing the tar sands. And with tar sands, suddenly they were the highest per capita emitter in the world, <laughs> right? So that's, that's the balance. And that's, that's the politics. And that's why we need to lead. Because historically, we've benefited. And when you're in that room with 190-something countries, many of, many of those countries were colonized. Many of them are still in screwed up situations for economic trade that we dominate. And that's the tension in the room, right? So that's why, as the US, the more we are actually acting, the more it helps those countries to not have an excuse to sit back. Yeah. But what was just briefly, what was really striking, the turning point for the Paris Agreement was that even if developed countries reduce dramatically, the emissions of developing countries was going up so high that we were still screwed. Yet you had to find a way that all those countries would agree to an agreement, right, where they felt they weren't being screwed. And that's why the Paris Agreement was the first universal environmental climate change treaty where everybody had to do something, but in different levels. And that's why the finance is critical. The US continues to not give the money that it says it will, and that affects everybody's confidence. And everybody knows the US is spending billions and billions on military, et cetera, on other things. And it's just heartbreaking. As an American, it's really heartbreaking to watch sometimes. It's better than Trump pulling us out of the Paris Agreement, but it's, you still wish, why aren't we doing more? Lindsay, hi. Um, you pretty much answered, oh, answered my question, which was finding, and you may have said it, and I, my hearing is zapped, but you may have said it, but the balance, the moral balance between helping developing countries with their energy needs and suppressing the lousy form of extraction that most of the rest of us have engaged in is, is really a, a moral question, obviously, but it, it's, so, it's, a, it's a conundrum that I've met so many times over. Well, why shouldn't they, whoever that might be, pointing in quotes, get what they have always wanted, which is what you, again in quotes, have. And, and finding that balance of introduction of more sustainable forms of energy for the developing countries without giving in to the great dams and the huge extraction of, well, of whatever the minerals or the might be is just, how do you even begin the discussion? It's just such a huge question of equity. And, and justice, I, I'm obviously. You just keep going. I remember um, there was a, when I was in my 20s, there was a British um, human rights lawyer, Baroness Kennedy. And I had a quote from her that I put on my wall and it said something like, human rights is not something you win, it's something you fight for every day. And I think we're just, you know, century after century, it's not actually that different. If you look, read the Bible, the same fights are going on in the Bible that we're seeing here. 
equity and justice. But the different thing, and this is why when we work with the climate negotiators in our quiet diplomacy, we have these dinners with about 15, 20 countries, and it's off the record, and we ask personal questions, and we talk about a sensitive issue. They come, they represent all negotiating groups around the table. The last one in June, at least three negotiators were crying because they know they're all, the, the climate change is different because everybody knows it's happening and everybody knows where it could go. It's like having this, um, It'd be different if you were negotiating um, something that either we do it or we don't. But if we don't do it, the science is so clear about where we're going. So you have the moral and the justice side, but we're in this space of everybody wants to hold on to their toys. And if we didn't have the science coming in, if we didn't have those IPCC reports, we'd be screwed because it's all politics in the negotiations. And it's the science that keeps sitting down and saying, well, you can do that, but this is where you're going. This is what's going to happen to your country. This is what's going to happen to your societies. And that's why, for me, what's most important now are not these big climate meetings. It's what you're doing on the ground. The negotiators have said to us, if people aren't protesting, our ministers aren't going to budge. And, and Black Lives Matter and... and um, Fridays for the Future were some of the most profound movements affecting us in the negotiating room. It was fascinating because they were like, look, people are actually wanting this. And one of the biggest problems is pushback in democracies. If, if you're pushing back on, if, if one, if a politician is actually trying to make that change, they are so vulnerable to being criticized. So we, we have to be part of that solution right now. And I think community work, and I think national work, that's what's going to make a difference when they go to a place like Dubai. Because by the time our negotiators go there, they've already got their remit of what they're allowed to say. But if they see people wanting it on the ground, that's a different story. And that's why I think that's where we are now. You've got to be asking for it, but also understanding, um, do we want a healthier world? Or do we want to go in this direction, which isn't a direction that our future generations or even our young people now will be able to cope with? That's the interesting wild card in this. Yeah. Nice to see you. So we, we have a Zoomer. Oh, we have a Zoomer. And then Robin. Yeah. Uh, Dwight, you can unmute. Two and a half billion people. Yes, but it's a wealth crisis. This the people who are the people who are driving the change are the wealthiest in emissions, for example. So, if it's a population issue, what we say on that is a child in Malawi is not a threat. A child in the U.S. is going to cause much more of what they're taking, right? Well, I think it happens in both ends of the spectrum. I think all kids are enticed by what they see in the media, and of course, strive towards that. Yeah. They live their lives in such a way. It's a pretty universal phenomenon throughout the populace, but I'm just curious to know whether or not that topic is addressed seriously in the news world. What I'm saying is, it, it is. But I'm saying that when they're looking at population, if I blame climate change on population, it's actually, okay, where are the drivers happening? They're actually happening in the wealthiest. But when we talk about population, the things that they're calling for are education of women and access to birth control. I think that comes in on itself. I mean, if you look at demographics, as we project into the future, it's quite possible that global population is Yeah. Yeah. Some figures want to be back to the back of the country and not to be in no time to that. Who knows? It's just a question. Yeah, it does, no, it does, Robert. It comes up, and it also comes up with that before we shift it on to population, where the highest populations, for example, are Gaza. That's one of the highest, well, no longer right now with the way that these people are being bombed. Um, one of the highest birth rates, right? Are they individually the highest emitters or using the most resources? No. And so that's where that conversation 
looks at, okay, well, yes, population, but which populations are driving it? So. There is a, White has a question on Zoom. So he can unmute and ask his question. White, you can unmute Hi, Lindsay. and ask the question. Hi there, can you hear me? <laughs> Um, thank you so much. This has been super interesting. I guess I'm I'm curious, what is keeping the U.S., China, and the other big emitters who are sort of resisting the transition, what is keeping them at the negotiation table in addition to the popular protest that you mentioned? Like, what, what do they see as their self-interest in this? What are they articulating? I, let me speak for the U.S. I can't speak for China, but for the U.S., again, it's money, I think. I think we make a lot of money on what drives climate change. We make a lot of money on industrial agriculture, on fossil fuel extraction, on un unsustainable economic systems. And that's why it's really helpful to say, okay, why did they choose carbon capture storage when we could be transfer we could be using that money to get um, where we can, as much renewable out there, or energy re reduction, energy efficiency, right? Why are we making those decisions? Why are we giving money to South Africa to build gas plants rather than putting solar all around South Africa? Well, because the gas company would be owned by a company that's willing to go in there and do that, but we don't want to put, the, we don't want to give money to people to have solar on their individual houses because we don't make money that way. So I think, Dwight, for me, what I see a lot of that pushback is lack of political will, huge lobbying, right? I was saying OPEC, it was extraordinary, leaking a letter threatening all their members at the COP for moving an inch on fossil fuels, because that's scary, too. You know, we, how do we do this? But I think if we're not going to do it, we're going to keep moving in that direction. Um, but I, I would say power and money and political will. And political will shifts when they realize the people want it, at least in democracies. But a lot of it comes down, I know that sounds simple, but power and money. I don't want to give up those lucrative things. Thank you. So I guess I'm curious, like, what is keeping them at the negotiation table currently, like, in the face of those forces and interests? Say again? What, what's keeping them at the table? Why come then? Why negotiate at all? Because temperatures are rising and everybody's hurting. Everyone is hurting. And actually, certain countries are moving. So at the COP, maybe this is a lovely story for you, the question on the COP. The Colombia announced they were going to do a cap on their fossil fuels. They're the sixth largest coal extractor in the world. And they said, we are going to act. Developing country, we are going to act. We're going to cap our fossil fuels. And then they said, and everything is against us in this. The minute we announced we're going to cap our fossil fuel extraction, our credit rating dropped. Our entire economy system is against the, the needed issues we want to do, right? But they were, they were so powerful. And then Australia said, yeah, you know, we know that fossil fuel, we know we need to transition. We know we need to move. We know we're a big fossil fuel economy, but we know we need to do this. So Dwight, I think what is why they're there is because the science is there and it's, it's scary and everybody knows it, but everybody's hoping somebody else will do it. Or where's the leadership? And often the leadership is coming from countries like depending on their governments. When the government changed to New Zealand, they were a leader in the developed countries. Um, Colombia changed. Um, I mean, it just, it just, I'm just thinking of certain countries. When the Canadian government changed just three weeks before the Paris Agreement was agreed, the Canadians came in, Trudeau brought in a whole new negotiating group, and if we didn't have them in the room, I don't think the developed countries would have pushed the way Canada got them to move. Because the government changes, and suddenly like, we can do this. What are we waiting for? So, so that makes a difference. When Biden came in, things changed, right? Suddenly, it was the same negotiating team from Obama to Trump to Biden. Thankfully, they didn't shift them. Um, but, but they weren't allowed to do certain things, but suddenly they were allowed to do things. So the US is saying, we need a 1.5. We need to hold to 1.5. And when I heard them say that, um, 
I, I almost fell off the chair because they've been fighting that language. But it was a change in politics. So that makes a big difference, Dwight. And also, you know, knowing where this is going, people being more aware. Ten years ago, I don't remember people talking about climate change very much, but now it's rare that people don't sort of at least know what something's happening, right? And that's really important. I hope that helps, Dwight. Totally. Thank you so much. Lindsay, are you seeing then that it is the public sort of pressure within these countries that are keeping them there? It's, you know, it's certainly not industry that's pushing them there, and, and they're realizing that there's a political price if they walk away from the negotiations and don't do something. Yeah, I mean, it was fascinating when, when the Trump administration, when Trump announced he was walking away from the Paris Agreement, the Americans under the Obama for the Paris Agreement had actually negotiated that once you announce you're going to withdraw, you can't do it for four years. <laughs> Right? They knew. So even though Trump announced it, he couldn't physically leave it for four years. By that time, there was a new election coming up. So the da it was a damage control. But nobody really wants to walk away from the climate change negotiations. Um, it's just how much you want to do. I was talking to an Australian military um, personnel who was at the Paris Agreement negotiations with the Australian team under the past Australian government. Now, again, they've just had a new government. You see the difference, the way they talk. They want to have human rights. Sorry. <laughs> right? Under the, past, um, under the past government, they went to the Paris Agreement, and this military personnel woman said to me, she does adaptation, so she really wanted change, and she wanted to see something. And the head of delegation said to his team, okay, guys, we're going to go to the Paris Agreement, we're going to say we're going to do things, but we're not going to do it. And she tells me this story, and she's horrified. But she's not a politician. So that's, that's where the pressure makes a difference. The UK pressure is incredible right now, right? They have a government that's a disaster. People are being arrested nonstop, blocking roads, doing this. It's fascinating. And they've just pulled out of the Energy Charter, which is a charter, 25 years old, where companies are allowed to sue a government um, if they change the regulation, so I can sue your government for saying you can't frack. So I'm going to sue you for profits that I can't make because you won't let me frack in your country. That was the energy charter, and countries are starting to step back from it. So things are changing. Political pressure was part of that. It's not fast enough, but it's fascinating. It's like a wave. Yes? So um, I know there's, there's certainly a hot political issue is um, the border crisis and I wonder if you have any sense of uh, how much of the uh, migration of people from South and Central America to the United States is due to climate issues. I'm sure a lot. People don't leave their countries unless they can't make a life there. Either it's politically repressive for them or in the case of Central America and a lot of the Latin American countries, the temperatures are changing to such an extent that actually the farming is, is profoundly affected. So yeah. And so that's another, I mean, it's a tricky one because you can use it as, we've got to act because we don't want migration. Well, you know, that can be a racist issue, but it's also migration can be a healthy side of an economy. But in the cases we're seeing of migration, it's, it's often because you can't, you can't survive in your country. Yeah. And in, interestingly, in Europe, the migration that's happening is because of war. It's not, it's climate, but it's actually war. So we've got Middle East, um, Ukraine. People are coming in for man-made disasters or man-created, yeah. I am so happy to see you. Uh, but I also have a question. I Do I remember correctly that you had said uh, among political will, uh, one should work locally at a, a ground level? Is that, is that still something that you really believe is useful? 
I think it's useful for local resilience. Resilience is a word that's being used more and more. Because temperatures are rising, and they will rise to a certain extent no matter what we do. But whether they rise to that catastrophic is not a guarantee right now, right? But with the rises we're seeing now, how do we build resilience in our communities? How do we support the poorest? How do we support our agriculture? How do we, you know, that's, that's the local, that's the community. Depending on your politics, but just, I think also just community action is so special. Because you show how you, you could do community energy systems people are starting up, right? Or community agriculture, which started in the USA. Um, so I think, I think everything is part of the situation, but political will for national action is critical in terms of regulation and action. Well, we, in uh, my part of, <laughs> of Western Massachusetts, uh, we are working, we don't have uh, farms per se that we're trying to protect necessarily. But we are doing things on the ground level, like getting people uh, uh, to start reducing their own waste and, you know, cleaning it up in that way. And that's what we're thinking where I live as the way we can do uh, work locally, like really local. And that is still useful. Yes. And the thing is, there's so much we could be doing. There is so much we can be doing. That's what the scientists were trying to say, right? It's at scale. But the question is, how do we even know what we could be doing? How do we organize that? And, and that's the critical local work, I think. And I, it's happening in the Berkshires. I know it's happening. But, but that also empowers people to say, look, the things we can do. Even if we can't control what's happening nationally, we can show things that we can do locally. I know it's 8.02. Can I just leave with one, one sort of message? The faith voice is incredibly powerful, and the interfaith voice even more. And actually, um, there's a last slide. Um, is it too late to show that final slide, Jim? It's the Quaker statement we wrote 10 years ago. Not if we got till midnight. But, <laughs> But the interfaith work, the faith, the faith voice is critical because the faith voice isn't political, right? And when the faith groups are calling out in the negotiations, it's really moving because most countries, most people in most countries have some kind of faith connection and it's a moral call. And so when we did this call, what we said for the Quakers, the, one more, that one. And that's what we had Quaker meetings from all around the world signing. Because it's a call to conscience, and it's less political, it's less dismissive. They dismiss activists outright. It's harder for them to dismiss a 15-year-old, or a church, or a mosque, or a synagogue, or a Buddhist temple. That's where it gets uncomfortable for the negotiators and the politicians. So use it. I put these out, this is, these have the latest climate science. We did these, these are all the climate quotes. You can send it to your, your, your politician and say, what are you doing? Here it is, this is what the science is saying. And you signed it, you approved it, what are you doing? It's online, so you could probably sort of Google it, but this is also like daily actions for your neighbor, and this is to send your politician. I didn't bring enough copies with me, but I can send them to the church um, once I'm back in Bonn, or you can sort of print them from your computer. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs>